My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. We need to use diplomacy and build international consensus to resolve our problems whenever possible. Our diplomats are working with a range of partners to strengthen human rights protections. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. Hello, and welcome to Diplomatic Community. I'm Kelly McFarland, Director of Programs and Research at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. America and the West's military withdrawal from Afghanistan was a defining moment in the Biden administration's first year in office. The decision's impact on the Afghan people and its ripple effects across South Asia are already showing. Within Afghanistan and the broader region, Citizens and their leaders have been preparing themselves for the events that took place in August 2021 for years. Now, the over 35 million Afghans, and Afghan women in particular, face an uncertain future marked by insecurity, hunger, and repression. In this episode, we discuss these problems with former Afghan ambassador to the United States, Roya Romani. It became apparent in our conversation that major steps are necessary both regionally and among the international community more broadly to create a stable and prosperous Afghanistan. We discussed issues of humanitarian aid, corruption, and ways forward for Afghan women. I would also like to note that this interview was recorded prior to the Biden administration's announcement that frozen Afghan government funds would be split between aid for the Afghan people and relatives of U.S. 9-11 victims. Roya Romani is a former Afghan diplomat who served as Afghanistan's first female ambassador to the United States and non-resident ambassador to Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, and the Dominican Republic from December 2018 to July 2021. She is currently a distinguished fellow at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Before entering government, she worked for several nonprofits that primarily focused on women's rights and education. Let's have a listen to the conversation. Welcome, Ambassador Romani. It's great to be here. So, uh, you know, I wanted to start off um, this season of our podcast is focused on evaluating the Biden administration's foreign policy as the team heads into its second year in office and beyond. And obviously, uh, the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan was arguably the defining moment of the administration's first year in office, foreign policy wise. And our our listeners are well aware of the U.S. perspective of what happened. And, you know, it's been all over the news for the past six months and especially back in August. Um, But I would like to hear your perspective on the withdrawal and specifically, you know, what should an American audience understand about its consequences for the Afghan people and for women in Afghanistan in particular? The very key phrase that you used here was, the withdrawal as a defining moment. Um, Let me um, start with giving this defining moment uh, a little bit of a context. The withdrawal in reality really started uh, since 2010. Uh, In 2010, when uh, it was announced by United States that the foreign troops will fully withdraw by certain date, while there was a surge um, announced later on in 2011. So the highest number of troops on the ground in Afghanistan was in uh, year 2011, while there was already some sort of a deadline announced for um, the uh, total withdrawal. So that defined the mode at that time. How did that define the mode uh, that basically rolled up to the to the very last trench. Uh, many people, including the region at that point, realized that there is a looming uh, end date to all of this. So everybody basically positioned themselves accordingly. There were a lot of power wielders, a lot of uh, uh, many warlords who became, uh, I call them money lords uh, after 2001. They, they, they shifted their gears and they started putting their money into businesses and stuff. They realized that there is an end date and, and they uh, uh, positioned themselves accordingly. If they needed to get more militias, more weapon, they did so. Or if they, if 
the people who were involved in corruption. They also uh, sort of were signaled that there is an end date and, and you have to do what you can at this point. Uh, on the other hand, it uh, exacerbated the lack of clear, um, the lack of clarity and consistency in part of international community, in terms of what they were there to achieve, what they wanted to get done, um, and so forth. Afterwards, uh, when uh, the mission changed uh, to resolute support in the year two thousand fourteen, uh, they. Uh, the uh, sort of psychology also somehow started shifting around that time once again. Uh, locally, people thought that uh, as the mission changed to that of resolute support and there was a residual force for train assist uh, uh, mission, uh, a train assist and equip mission, um, they um, thought that this might never end. This might be a um, way that it will continue one way or another. And so did the, a lot of the regional powers. They thought that this uh, will continue probably endlessly and they continued their own um, way of dealing with, uh, um, with the situation. What's important to know about the final trench of the withdrawal is, number one, that it was only 2,500 troops that were remaining in Afghanistan. That was supplemented by 5,000 troops uh, from NATO. And by their withdrawal, uh, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, why it happened? Because uh, that was the context I was giving. Then since 2010, there was this looming end date that Many did not really believe, including the government leadership, that it is happening, and especially it would happen very abruptly. Although it was announced, although there was the Doha agreement and all that, but then it was, uh, when it was announced in uh, April, uh, they were sort of stunned. What were the consequences of that? Of course, it was very dire because it was not it was not the withdrawal of the troops alone. It uh, just pulled out the entire economy that was built on the back of the international assistance. So the economy completely collapsed, and therefore people face hunger. The banking system that came under uh, sanctions um, was another uh, problem. But then overall, and at a different level, democracy was completely uprooted. And who lost the most? That was women. The, the women lost not only economically, socially, and personally, their very right and presence, uh, especially at the public sphere, came under question. So what to do moving forward, and what should the international community know, or the, the, your audience, um, what, what is important is that the international community must have a very frank and serious conversation among themselves about what is it that they want in Afghanistan. I'm not asking about their goals, which we have heard that they want to make sure that the Afghanistan would never be a threat to the rest of the world and uh, in terms of the terrorism, and they want um, uh, a government that would be inclusive and respect women's rights and human rights and all that. I am not talking about the list. I'm talking about given that you have that list of what you want, you it, it needs to be thought through and mapped out. Uh, how you want to achieve these goals, how much resources you are willing to uh, put into it, for how long you will be able to sustain it. And basically re uh, responding to these questions very realistically. Um, I want to end with an example that everybody agrees that right now the biggest looming um, crisis is the humanitarian one and, the, and what people are facing. But how is this problem going to be handled by mainly focusing on how to provide uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, food uh, or, or, or basic commodities or health care just in the form of humanitarian assistance? Because by nature, 
this is a bandit solution. This is a short-term solution. And it is no way to define what you want to do in this country and uh, in respect to the rest of the region. Yeah, I think that's an extremely important point to make. You know, you can have the the end goals that you speak of that the international community and, and the West talk about. Um, but unless you devise a plan to get there, you're not going to get there. And the humanitarian aid, yes, they need that. Uh, but it's something we've talked a lot about here at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy and have done working groups on this issue of food insecurity and conflict and, you know, which drives which and and how it's a very cyclical nature. And we've t- touched on humanitarian aid. You mentioned the, the regional dynamics at play and how when we announced withdrawal dates going as far back as 2010, 2011, and then over the course of the last decade, not only the players within Afghanistan, but the players in the region have also been preparing for this uh, to one extent or the other. So, you know, the, the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan doesn't just affect Afghanistan, it affects the region more broadly as well. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the region moving forward now that uh, the Taliban has taken over and the the United States is is no longer there? Um, Yes, uh, this is a very important uh, question. Over the past few decades, the regional countries have continuously dealt with Afghanistan as a a factor into their relationship vis-a-vis one another. Uh, In other words, Afghanistan have stayed in their peripheral vision while they have been dealing with other countries or or their neighbors or their rivals mostly. Um, So with the takeover of the Taliban, uh, there is no question that there would be additional uncertainty and instability um, that uh, would confirm or uh, conform uh, with their uh, attitude towards Afghanistan all along. So as a result, what the regional countries have done is uh, they, at the first instance, the uh, in initial instances, they are trying to insulate themselves to make sure that anything that happens in Afghanistan or Afghanistan or any crisis does not permeate to their borders easily. So they, they, they want to secure their borders, they want to insulate it further. Uh, and that's that's their uh, immediate reaction. Uh, and, and they have been somehow prepared for it. Secondly, they continue to hedge, uh, meaning they they try to look uh, and see who are uh, who is in power, and at this time the Taliban, and then who are the opposition, who are uh, potential um, threats to to who is in power, and they and they want to build a relationship somehow. Uh, with all of them, uh, this this was the same thing that we were seeing when the previous government was in power and the Taliban were working as an opposition force. Uh, so um, that they were they were having a relationship with the Afghan government, but at the same time with the Taliban. So they are doing the same thing with any potential forces that would be opposing the Taliban. Um, and thirdly, uh, the medium to long term effect of this for the region definitely would have consequences. Um, and uh, at this point, they do not seem to be positive in any ways. Um, because uh, some of the, the positive movements would be, of course, um, economic uh, relationships, uh, trade routes, uh, connectivity. Um, and, and much more uh, in the region, and, and also a region that is least integrated, in fact. Uh, so that does not seem to happen in a context where there is a government with absolutely lo- no recognition and uh, also uh, a very uh, severe uh, um, sort of uh, uh, bureaucracy or ruling to the, to the extent that it even exists. Uh, number one. Number two, the violation of human rights and lack of uh, trust in a government uh, would also 
uh, influence that relationship. And But thirdly and more importantly, uh, if Taliban continue to uh, be oppressed, an oppressive regime to um, uh, oppress and um, imprison uh, those who uh, are raising opposing voices, that, that they have no tolerance for presence of women. And in fact, uh, just write out, uh, get rid of 50% of the population and their potential um, to add to the country's uh, potentials uh, in all walks, politically, economically, socially, uh, uh, which uh, the, and all those added values that women bring, they are not going to prosper. And that would also have a long-term negative effect for the region. Uh, a country that does not allow its women to have uh, uh, access to their very basic rights, to their human rights, would definitely and undoubtedly uh, provide a, an environment for extremist ideologies to grow, uh, for um, uh, radical uh, views uh, to be exercised. And, and that worldview, whether they like it or not, will permeate to the rest of the region. So uh, when you look at the, all the research and empirical evidence between uh, oppressive regime and equalities, particularly gender inequality and its nexus with the insecurity, it's right out there, especially when it comes to the violent extremism. Uh, that is what should be the most concerning to the region moving forward uh, into the future. And particularly in an era that we are all connected, um, even if we don't have roads or planes or relations with one another, we have our phones, and that may, that connects us. And that is a dangerous trend and will emanate to the rest of the region. So sticking on the, on the topic of Afghan women, I know that um, our colleagues at the uh, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, um, and, and you are working on a new project called the Onward for Afghan Women Project. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about that and what your goals are for the project? Yes, the Afghan, um, the, the Onward Project for Afghan Women uh, is primarily a, a platform that would uh, give uh, space to Afghan women leaders uh, to make sure that their voices uh, continues to be heard and their views and recommendation could get incorporated to the policies. The second goal is to continue to provide a space uh, for uh, women and their voices uh, who still live in Afghanistan. Uh, given that uh, the international media's attention is already moving away from Afghanistan and the space for the women who live in Afghanistan shrinks in uh, the international media, uh, the project wants to make sure that that very local information and updated information continue to trickle and people are aware of what is happening and how they could make the uh, they could uh, make policies that are practical and effective um, and then um, last but not least we would like to continue to press on the importance of paying attention to women's rights, uh, their role and participation, as it defines the basis of any peaceful and prosperous society. Well, I applaud you on the initiative, and uh, we wish it the best. And we know that uh, you're working with some some great people over at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. You mentioned in your answer to your first question the role of warlordism and and corruption, and we've dealt with corruption at the Institute and have, have done, have written on this topic, done research on it, held working groups. Um, one of our current season episodes is on corruption of the podcast. Could you talk a little bit about just what level, what role corruption has played in Afghanistan over the course of the last 20 years? 
a significantly distractive role uh, is the shortest answer. And um, corruption somehow and unintentionally was woven into how the approaches to Afghanistan was designed from the very outset. Let me clarify that by an example. When the uh, international community rushed to Afghanistan in 2001, and then the immediate effect of that was that it sliced the society into different groups. Those who could get jobs and get um, salaries in thousands of dollars, and those who would really remain at the very lower echelon and who would uh, get salaries in tens of uh, dollars. So meaning one would get 5,000, one get 50 per month. That that uh, slicing of the society, while they, uh, there was huge inflation, demand for housing, demand for services, and all of them very scarce because of the years of wars and destruction and everybody uh, who had left. And, and it was just starting off at the very, very basic low level, already provided the ground at that very grassroots level corruption. That, 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 was the, that was the starting point. Moving forward and then at the, at, the, at the middle scale, all the brokers learned that if there were the new brokers that emerged and then the, all those commanders that they became uh, mid-level brokers, they, they learned how to transfer their uh, uh, knowledge of fighting on the, on the, in the field to that of changing uh, money from one hand to another and and that that was pro, uh, pretty uh, profitable they they became that mid level brokers and then there was the much bigger scale or the high level brokers the, to the extent that there were people who robbed the bank like the highest uh, people related to the heads of the states they they were uh, shareholders of the biggest bank that that they they managed to basically rob it and and Hundreds of millions of dollars went missing. So uh, at, at each level, it, it was uh, uh, manifested. Uh, it it uh, really took root. Uh, one of its causes was also a culture of war. People had just come back and they, they did not have the capacity or necessarily uh, the technical know-hows uh, in terms of how to uh, uh, use this uh, to rebuild the country. But besides that, there wasn't also a much of coordination and good design in part of the international community. The international community was equally divisive. Each country did their own thing and they did not necessarily coordinate it. And they came usually with prescriptions. It was not that they came or and asked and looked and said, okay, so what would the people of this village need? It was basically, we are funding um, um, education for uh, villagers of, I don't know, so many hundred villages, uh, women, uh, women uh, they came, for example, uh, with an idea that they will be funding um, human rights education uh, for several thousand women in several hundred villages without necessarily uh, knowing whether that that would have a um, positive impact or not. What the reaction was, a lot of people rushed out and said, okay, so there is money available to achieve this goal. How do we fit ourselves in this? to access those funds. So this was something that, that basically grew over time. But the nature of it, as I mentioned before, particularly shifted as everybody realized that there is an end date to this flow of money. Uh, again, I alluded to that before, that the, we were living in a fake 
economy that was built on the back of the international assistance, a country that 70% of its revenues and spending expenditure came from outside world. The entire health system was run uh, by international assistance. So all of that collapsed when it disappeared. And for many of those who knew or had ideas that it would come to an end, they tried to exercise more of that uh, sense of urgency and, and try to get what they could. Uh, and in addition to that, then the lack of cohesion and political stability, which was exacerbating every day, like literally, that contributed uh, to that level of corruption at the at the go- level across the government officials and, and cabinet uh, level people. A lot of members of cabinet knew that it is very possible that they would be fired uh, the next day and they would be just out there without nothing after being minister for weeks or months or years. Because of that lack of cohesion and a lack of leadership, bad governance, most people somehow were involved in corruption. The other element of that was that when the corruption is so prevalent at the very leadership, at the very top level, then uh, people who were not exercising the same methods, frankly speaking, those who were not corrupt, they were not considered to be team players. All right. Ambassador Romani, I want to thank you a lot for joining us today. Uh, This has been an insightful conversation, and thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. That was Diplomatic Community. Thanks for listening to this episode. Please share the episode on social media and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us wherever they listen to podcasts. This episode was produced by Alistair Somerville. Audio editing for this episode was done by Aaron Jones. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast. Follow us on Twitter at GU Diplomacy and visit our website, isd.georgetown.edu to learn more about our work. Until we meet again.